The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Nice lighting you've got there, by the way. Nice little kind of it's side light coming through the window. Yeah, I'm looking out of the ocean at the moment. Where are you? Where are you? Where's home? Uh, on its hungy, on Waiheke. Ah, oh, so do you cruise across the harbour every single day to, to go do work? I, I do, mate, yeah, and um, we're putting a stop to that. We're looking for a place to move. We're looking for a place in town because it's, a, it's probably four hours travel for three hours work a day. Whoa. Yeah, it must so be that. Knock that, are you knock gonna... that down to five minutes, then I'll be happy five minutes travel. Are you going to have to sell up and buy again, or are you going to be able to keep the place on? No, we're, rent, we're renting over here. We got really lucky that the guy, our next-door neighbour, um, who is very, really hairy, owns two properties. Um, and we found this a couple of years ago, just when we are out taking the dog for a walk, moving up from uh, Wellington, just after we'd had our kid. And, um, yeah, we just wandered around. This place is right on the beach, and it sort of had a sign that it was to lease for, for weeks and weeks. <clears throat> we thought it would be outside our price range, which it probably is. Um, but he let us rent out the downstairs apartment. So you're separately on the beach at Waiheke, like on the beach, on the yeah. beach, or across the road on the beach? Well, like yeah, there's a road that separates us. So yeah, it's um, it's bloody good, man. It's been awesome, especially through lockdown. It was incredible, and especially with having a baby, you know, so you don't really go anywhere or do anything. Yeah. Um, and then lockdown was around, and we was working from home anyway, so it was great. But now it's gone to the point where it's um, well, with especially with having work in town and um, and, and it's winter. It, it is bloody boring. Yeah. You know, yeah. In, in winter, it's dull. And we've got no friends over here and we never catch up with anyone. And we went into town a few weeks ago and went to a play and went out for dinner and caught up with some mates. It's like, oh, yeah, we're not 80. <laughs> we, could still be enjoying, we could still be enjoying our lives if we tried a little bit. So, yeah. It's funny when you move backwards and forwards as to what you enjoy and what you miss. I mean, like about seven, oh, yeah. year, seven years ago, I moved from Auckland to Dunedin. And um, I, it's, it's it's very strange. One of the things I find strange in the South Island is like we drive from Dunedin to Christchurch, you know, regularly enough to see things or see people or whatever. And looking out to the water, there's no islands. And because I grew right. up in Auckland and I holidayed in Northland, so like, you know, a third of my yeah. year every year was in Mungafai Heads. I'd spent time up there. It's really quite eerie to drive up a coastline, look to the right um, yeah. and see nothing but water. It actually feels quite eerie, and it's like, okay, so Chile is the next stop out there, but <laughs> when you live in the North Island, it feels like, especially where I was, kind of Auckland to Northland, there's always stuff on the horizon, and in the South Island, it's not. It's interesting to feel what feels yeah. very foreign, and it'll be interesting for you once you get back to the city, is what you miss from Waiheke and what you pick up from the city and vice versa. Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Levin, and so we, and also spent a lot of time out at Waitadili Beach, so that was... That was, you know, west facing. So same thing, except for Kapiti Island, which was a little bit to the south. It's just nothing, you know. There's just so I was used to that, um, but then also just really got used to being near the water. Yeah, which is a, unfortunately it's a pretty expensive thing to get used to. So I was going to Wellington and lived on Oriental Parade, then out at Moore Point, uh, then round at Lowry Bay and Eastbourne. Um, and you just get used to that water, and there's something about it that's just really good for your um, for your state of mind. <laughs> and we you're so spoiled, but then you do get used to it. Now I'm going to move into the city, and um, then I think fairly quickly I'm going to wonder why we moved into the city. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to go like apartment living with views, or are you going to try to go to the yeah, suburbs? Well, we're, yeah, we're looking at we're looking to buy in there, and it's obviously there's um, there's all the chat around that. But I think if you're willing to move into an apartment, which we are. You know, there's just there's just a trade off, isn't there? I mean, everybody wants to have a backyard and all that sort of stuff. But if you want to live in Auckland and have the work, then you don't get to have everything. Unfortunately, you can't you can't sort of cry about wanting everything. Um, you can just move into an apartment and 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 not have to travel three hours a day in a car and traffic jams, which would drive me up the wall. You know. Well, that's the trade off, isn't it? The trade off's going to be yeah. uh, is, it, is it lifestyle with the uh, larger property and grass out the back, or is it lifestyle that you can just spend more time with your family because you're in a apartment near work? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I'd far rather you know spend the time with my family. So I'm you know we'll be looking to move by Victoria Park somewhere. So we've got the park there for the kid and uh, five minutes walk to work, and um, it just allows you to do a lot more with your day. You know, so I'll be trying to do my uh, work on other projects during the day, which I can't at the moment because I'm in a bus and on a ferry and skateboarding to work <laughs> electric skateboard 
No, no, no. The old school. The old school. Yeah, well, I sort of found myself getting into town and then I was jumping on those scooters. Yeah. I think this idea that those scooters get people out of their cars is just uh, it's wishful thinking. I think, you know, you're not driving along in a car and you think, oh, there's a scooter. I'll get out and I'll use the scooter. You're walking along and you think, oh, I'm lazy. I'm going to use the scooter. <laughs> Yeah, I bought a couple of those. I bought a couple of those electric ones for my kids, and I think that I actually think that even the lime scooters and that kind of stuff, which are everywhere, very funny South Park episode about that, but that they are everywhere is um, is a bit of a trend. I think that I notice around Dunedin because you think Dunedin, you know, student town, um, they'd be massively used. They were massively used for about six months, and now they're right. all very nicely lined up on the street, which means no one's touched them. And I think maybe the right. same for cars. The people might have done it for a while, but then they've kind of gone, actually, you know, if I drive a bit closer, I don't have to go in the cold for as long and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, sure. You yeah, know, they're certainly everywhere up in Auckland. I mean, you know, do you need do you need those? I don't know. I mean, they, and they are an eyesore. I do like it when you sort of see an old person <laughs> Walking on the street, grabbing them off the footpath and throwing them on the road, or throwing them in, you know, the, where the hate is so intense for this latest development because they are they're a litter. And then I wonder, you know, what happens to all those batteries? You know, like what happens to all the where does where do all these busted things go? It's just more things to throw in the oceans, I guess. And hopefully, you know, evolution is going to lead to fish being able to digest batteries and plastics better. You know, I think that's the problem. Rather than us becoming better as a species, I think that, that fish need to develop to a point where they can digest our litter. If we're here, maybe fish will be the, the, oh, yeah. the overlords in the future. Yeah. Hey, you're talking, you're, you're talking about looking for a house. Um, and I guess, I mean, as, as we do in this podcast, kind of go wherever the conversation leads. But um, I noticed Chloe Swarbrick the other day put out, it was a guy called Max Rashbrook, who's a Victorian academic. <laughs> who we've had on the podcast before as well, putting out a, a an opinion piece saying house prices need to drop by 40% to help first house yeah. buyers. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts? Oh, look, I mean, I've got, like everybody um, in New Zealand that, um, I mean, everybody's got an opinion on it, probably depends where you are on the um, on the ladder, but I just think, you know, I was talking to a mate about it the other day, it seems to me that it's, it's criminal that something should be regarded as a human right, as something that can be, invested in and have the price pumped up and you know for me it should be you know and i think this would be generous but i think you should own a maximum of two houses i think that's absolutely maximum and anything over that that you own should be put back on, into the market and put, become available for people to buy i think you've you know i think i saw a guy who had 100 houses or something like that i mean you know that you're profiteering off that sort of stuff it sort of um, should make you sick uh, but if it doesn't, it's probably an indication of what kind of a person you are. Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, there should just be no, you should just be unable to, and, and also the way that things are sold at the moment, like I think in the UK, you have to name your price. There's no auctions, there's no tenders, there's none of that stuff. And that's the thing, like we we own a house, but there's this thing where you can go and say, um, uh, how much do you want for it? And then the, you know, you might have three or four people three or four lots of couples wanting to buy a property and then the agent can just come back and make you go up and up and up and up and up. So you could have a vendor that's happy selling a house for 500 grand, but because of the competition, it ends up going for 800 grand, rate 50. And now mm. that's the new price for that property. And it, it shouldn't be like that. It should be, how much do you want for the house? And then I'll buy it. You know, you should not be able to drive prices up um, in the manner that they're doing. I just think it's, I think it's an easy fix, but I think it's, Whoever whoever has the balls to change it um, won't get voted back into government for a few terms. Yeah, I, and like all this stuff, I mean, all of this stuff. Everybody with any common sense, whether it's um, whether it's global warming or any of the stuff. I mean, we know the answers, but everyone, you know, anyone in power is too scared to do anything about it. So I'm I think a, we solve a few beers and and we'll leave it at that. I'm a bit more <laughs> of a pessimist than you. I don't know if there is an easy solution for the housing one. Like I I have no qualms at all with the idea of everyone owning two houses, and that's about it. And, but straight away, my kind of, I don't know, my debate brain goes, so what about if everyone's got two houses, the people who can afford to have two houses, and are there still going to be a group of people which still aren't going to be able to afford to buy a house because of their circumstance? And what happens when the, um, you know, the government has let them down in social housing and all of a sudden we're short houses? Is that a possibility? I, I, oh, yeah, I mean, 
I think it's yeah, real me tough. Saying, me saying that you can own two houses is me being is me reaching out to the right wingers. You know, I think you should. <laughs> I, think, I think you should own one, but I mean, there does have to be. There's, you know, this. It's it is difficult, and then it comes down to you know. There's everything else that feeds into it. It's also a taxation thing, right? So if corporations are being taxed properly, then we don't have an issue with social with social housing because there's enough money there. And um, you know, there's um, it gets me angry, mate. So I just try and stay away from the news and stuff. And I, I you know, I I chat with my friends, and um, you know, it's just, it's just so sad what happens for a lot of people out there. And you know, you think about the people that are sweeping in. Uh, garages and that's considered housing and that's got no insulation and, and I'm sure that you um, like I um, you sort of go through your flatting years of, of sleeping in places where you, you, your bed sort of stacked eight feet high with yeah. blankets and yeah. breathe, you know moisture comes out and it was just part and parcel of it and you're crook all the time and I mean it's amazing that it takes this long to do something about it and then as soon as the government wants to do something about it you get what are they the um, the homeowners association or something like that that comes out or the landlords association and comes out and talks about how hard things are for them well you know if you don't like it sell up you know. oh look I, I i agree i just i had this conversation with a property investor on the podcast actually a couple of months ago and if i i don't even care necessarily about the the idea of what the suggestion from max was that i saw via chloe's facebook page um, but I think also I know that if house prices drop by 40% over that period, what's going to happen is fewer people will put the houses on the market because they're not going to want to lose money, which means there'll be yeah. less housing stock, which means those that are on there will drive the price through the roof. So we're still in the same place. Well, I mean, it has to be completely government driven. And yeah, you, have yeah. to say, you have to say, this is the law. You can only own two homes. Everything else has got to be on the market within X amount of years. And it's not a choice. It's You have to do it. Yeah. Um, and those guys, those guys are going to take a loss, and you can imagine how happy they're going to be about it. But, um, you know, um, I, I mean, we, we own a house, and um, I can, you know, the, the capital gains that you get from a house, I don't know if you own one, but it's, I mean, it's, it's disgraceful. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like having, it's like owning a company, the amount that you gain from just, you know, you've got a house that sits there and does nothing, and yet your wealth goes through the roof like that. It's crazy. So, I mean, I think from memory, who was it? Was it Top wanted to come in and tax the capital gains on houses as well? That was one of their policies that you'd be taxed on on how much um, how much uh, the valuation of your house went up year by year. Um, and you know, Labor obviously talking about capital gains tax as well. And I think you know, for me, I think you should why should you should be taxed on every single dollar you earn? Why why are some groups not having to pay tax? And the only the only groups that are not having to pay tax are the are, are the wealthy, because I can tell you that the guy that's working in the warehouse or the guy that's you know doing forty hours but still can't put um, still can't make ends meet, he's paying tax on every single dollar he earns. Yeah, and it's a, it's a sad state of affairs that we have a, we have a government that um that are absolutely sort of in control, like we've never had before on MMP because they have a majority. Yeah, they're sitting yeah. back on their hands, not being inventive with how, yeah. for example, the current country could bring more income. And for example, legalizing cannabis, which I've talked about ad infinitum, yeah. which would have brought half a billion dollars tax into the uh, into the country. You know, capital yeah. gains tax should be bought, and all these things. I, I, not. I guess it's okay to say this, but you know, locally living as David Clark, and I actually ran into him the other day at a park as I was running my dog. And I kind of said, dude, you guys should be doing everything. You should be doing everything because you can. Because yeah. next time around, I mean, bless the Greens. I have no problems with the Greens. That's kind of where I sit politically. But the Greens will be a part of your partnership and you may not be able to do anything you want, whereas you can this time. Why aren't you doing everything in these three years? And it's and it's because, and I don't say this in like a bad way because it was a political um, choice at the time. It was because promises were made before the last election. And I'm like, fuck the promises. Let's let's get yeah. into what's best for the country and let's get some things passed and put in place that you may not ever be able to do again because there will be either, you know, a Winston Peters handbrake if he was to ever get back in, or there'll be another group who wants to, you know, tweak it by twelve percent, which means it won't go through, or whatever. And they're just not. So yeah. it's I'm really disappointed with that. And while there are areas that they made promises, there's also areas where they didn't. Um and yeah, I mean I <sighs> I mean, as it's just sort of been, it's almost like New Zealand's um, Obama. You know, it's like you, you you have high hopes, and then it's just—I mean, it's always just more of the same, man. You know, it's. Um, 
Yeah. Well, the thing I mean, about I, at the end of the day, what I'm really glad about is that um, you know there's no other leader that I'd want to be in, and no other party that I want to be heading the government. And I'm certainly, once again, I'm really glad that we had um, you know a left leaning government, and while we had what we've had really big issues like COVID, yeah. um, like the shooting in Christchurch. Similarly, when you know we had um, you know when uh, we went to well, when the world went to war um, with Iraq, that we had, you know, a Labor government at that time that said there's no way we're going to, you know, join this. It's a it's a load of rubbish. Whereas I think if we had, you know, um, National or a right-wing government in there, we would have been up to our necks and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, that stuff's great, but it's like it would be nice to see some actual change happening. I did this the other day. Pardon me for looking off to the left, but I'll bring it up. Um, you know, people are starting. People are starting to get. I don't know what you call it, but like, uh, it's a little bit sick of COVID and sick of conversations around lockdowns and that kind of thing. Um, but I had to look for the first time, and I don't know if you were the same, but most of us were on that kind of World Info website for COVID like twice a day when we were in lockdown, seeing what the numbers were. I hadn't done right. it for a very, very, very long time, but someone said something to me the other day about the rumblings about this Labour government and open up the borders and you know COVID this and promising another lockdown at level four and yada 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 and I just went back onto it I'll I'll bring it up because I tweeted this out and I had a look at the numbers for countries that are similar to us and this is why I'm thankful as you've just said for the government we had during COVID and at the moment New Zealand sits here if people can see this on their screens with our COVID Mm. numbers the population of about five million so I've gone up to about five and a half and down to about four and a half and look at the cases versus even Ireland below us, 3,000 versus over 300,000. Costa Rica above us, 3,000 versus over 400,000. It's like you look at this and you kind of go, you know what? Yeah. There is debt coming and we have borrowed to get through this, but we're living like no one else in the world's living right now. And I'm very thankful for that. And it's yeah, 100% probably. because of a Labour government with advice from yeah. experts, but them implementing it. Yeah, them listen, actually listening, you know, and yeah. you had, I think, the other day was saying, you know, you've got to listen to the medical experts and the medical experts were saying that what we're doing is exactly the right thing and what would you do? And he said, well, I'd listen to the medical experts. And so, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it, but there is always people that want to complain about things. And that's why I just find it easier to stay away from listening to the conversations because, you know, I used to get, you know, I used to get really involved in that. I used to be the guy on Facebook that's having those yarns. And there's just, you know, you just don't make a difference. It just, you do not. So I got off Facebook and that's been a big help. And I've just getting older has been a big help as well. But, um, you know, that sort of idea of screaming at each other, you can see how far it gets you. If anything, it probably um, creates a bigger divide rather than bringing anybody to it your way of thinking. No, nobody ever says, oh, yeah, I never thought of it that way. Um, I was thinking about your 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 daytime job. Can we call it your daytime job? You've got a gig on Radio Hodaki from 4pm till 7pm nationwide. Uh, you with Jason Hoyt. want we'll to talk about you and Jason and your relationship on screen shortly as well. Um, two things. The first is, why don't you, uh, talking about the commute, why don't you just broadcast out of home? I mean, the, oh, you said, do I own a home? This, yeah. is, this is my home. I've got my studio in my home. You could just spend a couple yeah. of days broadcasting out of your home and not actually having to go to Hodaki. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something, especially since it's my first time doing radio, um, and I think there's really been something to being in the room with somebody and reading what the energy is to it. Yeah. Um, we did a couple where we did podcasts, but I, I, I think especially given my lack of experience, um, and when you're, like if it was just me, that'd be fine, but you can really read the energy, and, and with it being sort of, well, an attempt at comedy, um, having that feel I think is really important um, to delivering something that is even marginally better than if we were in separate rooms. So I think that's the idea there. And, and, you know, I think I'd be taking the piss if I, you know, if they hired me and I said, yeah, well, one of my needs is that I'm going to be, I'm going to be working from home. <laughs> Still, you look at what can be done these days. It's amazing. The other thing I was going to oh, ask. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, and I think eventually that will be, that will be a great place to get to for sure. But it's, um, I, I really want to do as good a job as I possibly can with it, you know. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun, yeah. you know, being in, actually being in there and talking things through and um, and then doing the show in person. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is about five years ago, it was Alex Behan, I'm sure that's his surname, surname B-E-H-A-N, Alex. Um, at oh. that stage, 2016, it was definitely called Haraki. And the story, <laughs> that, now, now I don't know whether this is accurate or not, but there was certainly yes. an article written that he let, one of the reasons he moved on was because he was calling it Hodaki 
and basically got told you can't call it that. It's called Hauraki for a reason, yada, yada, yada. What's the, what's the practice now? It's Hauraki. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And, yeah, I mean, that was that was weird because I remember seeing that because I wasn't – I obviously didn't know any of the guys down there when that was happening, but I remember that. And it was sort of a, um, a parting shot, wasn't it? Um, yeah, but no, certainly – no conversation about it at all. It's all very much kia ora and mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, look, man, if you're not if you're not um on board with that sort of stuff in this day and age, then um it's gonna be all over for you pretty quick, I think. Radio Hodaki is such a Hodaki is such a um amazing brand. I know a little bit of the I know the the well I knew, I don't really have any contact with him, but no knew the man who gave Hodaki the boat that they originally oh. went out in the harbour with. And actually right. hear, hear the story of how it all started. And people must know the story, obviously, that started as a pirate radio station and then basically got given the ability to, um, you know, become commercial. But one of the stories that I maybe think is not told, and I don't know if this is speaking outside of school, if that is the saying, is that I think that back in the day there was a little bit of, uh, even though the government was protesting about Hodaki starting up and saying, you know, these pirates shouldn't be doing it, I also think there was a little line there where they were going, we actually want to test the commercial market as well. So it was kind right. of, in one hand, they were going, no, 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 these pirates, that's terrible. But on the other hand, they were going, well, the commercial model needs to be tested somehow. Maybe we can test it with these guys. And I think they were yeah, probably right. playing yeah, both yeah. both sides. Um, they don't get blamed for it at all. Yeah, no, it's not stupid. Yeah, but it was amazing. But but your partner there is, your partner, your, uh, your radio husband, uh, Jason Hoyt. Yeah. I, I got to say, and I'm going to play a little bit of it here for people to see, um, talk back on TVNZ On Demand. Let me just play a little bit of, of this video so people can see it. Is I love it. Lovely to chat as always, Pete. He's tackling the big issues. That social media stuff's beyond me, Ken. With opinions you can trust. You don't get to the top in this business by having positive, constructive things to say. <laughs> Tune in to Malcolm White on Talk Back FM. You're taking a hammering in the ratings, aren't you? Well, at least I haven't got complaints pouring in because my bazookas are hanging out. <laughs> Talk back. It is Full very, very, now. very TV funny. TV. I really enjoy it. And, and one of the reasons I enjoy it, but it's probably a bit of an inside joke, is I worked at ZB for, you know, 10 years. And I can, right. and I can, I mean, it's a bit of a fly on the wall mockumentary type show, but I watch it at night. I just go, yep, that's accurate. Yep, yep, that's pretty <laughs> accurate. Yep. Yep, no, I know who that was, and it's, it's, I, find yeah. it, I find it very funny. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun to make, and it happened pretty quickly. But um, Jason and I, we didn't sort of – trying to remember the first time I met him was on the ACC, I think, doing a um, cricket commentary when they got me on a couple of years ago. Um, or it might have been he was on Wellington Paranormal. Um, he was not on an episode of that, but we, you know, we didn't really talk very much at all, actually. And in fact, I don't think I had met him at that point, so maybe that was the first time. Then we did a bit of cro- cricket commentary together, and we sort of um, struck a chord doing that. You know, you sort of get a feel for where people are coming comedically, and um, it's a funny place to be doing it, cr- uh, commentating in cricket. But yeah, it was really good. And then so Jay sent me a message after we did one game in particular, and he said, "If you've got anything you want to make, give me a shout." And I had a a couple of ideas. One, um, one about a depressed do- uh, GP who's terrible at his job. <laughs> um, and another about a right wing talk, and it was really it was only that. No, it was just really you know behind the scenes of a right wing um, talkback radio host, and it just made sense once Jay said, you know, do you want us to do something that it would be that. Um, and yeah, we just we just nutted it out um, over about a week, and it happened super quickly, you know came together really, really fast. And neither of us had written for TV that sort of length before. Um, so we Googled how to write a sitcom. Um, and that was a big help. And then, yeah, and then just cracked into it, really. And sort of TV and Z were keen right from the start. Um, yeah, and it came together really quickly. And I think, yeah, um, TV and Z were really good. Steve Barr, who's there, was really good at giving notes, um, which was helpful. But... Yeah, you just wanted to sort of push it as much as you could. And Jay, Jace is just incredible in the show, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. For people who haven't seen it, TV, TV and Z On Demand is the place to go. It's a, I find it really funny. I, I know that I probably see it more than others do, but it's 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 great. I, I love it. It's really good. Um, I wonder as well, it's, you know, there are some, there are some people in it, like 
uh, Hillary Barry and those kinds of people, TVNZ greenlining it really quickly. Uh, do you think that was any commentary of pushback against the Mike Mike Hoskins of the world, or was it just uh, it's always narratively a good story means good production means let's make it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, there it's sort of um, you know from Steve Barr's point of view, it was Jason Hoyt and Mike Minogue want to make a TV show, so. You know, we sort of come with our own audience straight away, so it has to be a fairly bad idea. And then the fact that we um, wanted to put in, you know, you could sort of cross promote it by having other talent that existed in the TV and stable sort of made sense. The conversations around um, talk back, um, especially in the age of um, COVID as well, um, you know, it was just sort of ticked a bunch of boxes. You're going to have people that um, hate um, talk back that, you know, the same people that hate talk back to listen, but listen to it because they want to know what these guys are saying are the same sort of people who watch the show and vice versa. So it made sense from, yeah, from that point of view. And it wasn't just Mike Hoskin. I mean, that's, you know, it's really cookie kind of stuff. What the, you know, what those talk back hosts do it's and, and, you know, in the show it was, it was very much about wanting to get across this thing that, you know, these guys, I don't even think that they believe, you know, 90% of what they say. It is a job. It is, they're saying things to um, to make people irate, to generate debate, to make them listen, to sell advertising. And that's what Talkback is. It's not supplying content, um, you know, to listeners. It's supplying um, customers to companies who sell, who you know, who purchase advertising on those stations. Same as television. Um so yeah, they have to get you listening because they're never, you know, Mike Hoskins never going to get to a point where he goes, okay, I've solved all the problems in the world. Now I'm going to start compl- stop complaining about stuff. No. You know, he just switches around, you yeah. know, like he did with COVID, how from day to day he just totally changed what his. Oh, they should be doing this. They start doing that. So he goes, oh, you should be doing. This. I mean, it was hilarious. Yeah, um, you're but it's right. the same in Alan Jones and you know John Laws and over in the states and you know they're all the same. You're right, though, about the job of the talkback host. It's really the job of any, not to not to belittle the industry that I uh, still love and was a part of, but it's really the job of any radio host is to stay listening to hear all the ads. You know, and I remember, yeah. I remember saying that some person was giving me ass, you know, which I got on a regular basis as a talkback host, and they were like, you're not doing your job. And I just said to them on air, I said, look, my job is to have you stay listening to all the ads play and then have you come back after the ads. Yeah. That's actually my job. And if I do yeah. that, I'm successful. How, however you stay, that doesn't matter. And there's a great bit yeah. in the um, Howard Stern movie where he, yeah, as a young, time. yeah, as he knocks out the 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 breakfast host with ratings at, you know, the stalwart of the station, and they look at to why he was so successful as a young broadcaster, and they said, you know, half of the people love what he wants to say, would love what he says, yeah. and wants to know what he's saying next, and the other half of the people hates what he says, and they want to know what he's going to say next. Say next. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. And, what, and I guess what amazes me is that, you know, intelligent people listen to that stuff and just eat it up. You know, they, they, just, they just buy all of it. And I guess with Hosking... Because I, you know, I tried to listen to a bit of him, but I spent four or five years in Australia, so I, you know, heard the John Lawses and all those sort of guys that they have going around there, and um, is it Ray Hadley and stuff? Um, yeah, what the thing with those guys is, ninety-five percent of the time they make sense. So it's the five percent where they're saying something really outrageous, and so people are like, "Oh, well, he makes sense." The ninety-five percent of the time, yeah. so maybe this makes sense as well. You know, it's. Um, but it's funny what people will buy into, yeah. Which is actually the theory of a cult, you know. That 95 percent <laughs> of what this, you know, this this leader is saying makes sense, and it's all love, peace, and moonbeams. And this other one about yeah, about right. group sex and drinking this funny liquid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he must be right here too. Yeah, that's right. Well, we'll give it a crack. We're prepared to give it a go. It's been right so the, far. The, the yeah. other thing about talk radio, which is fascinating, is I was a fairly arrogant young man, as a lot of us are, and in my thirties, and kind of going, well, I've been doing this for a while now. You know, I'm approaching yeah. 40. It's time for me to move on from this kind of entry level position and going to my bosses and saying, you know, when Holmesy started and when Leighton started and when Larry started, and these, they were in their 30s when they got given their shift. It's time for me to find a spot. And um, there was no spots to be available. So I was also talking to Radio Live, who for, for new listeners was a, an old radio station in New Zealand that, that tried to go up against ZB and got told by the boss there, oh, look, we just think that conservative talk is where we're going to be for the next 10 years and right. and they try and they're gone 
you know they tried to be the All Blacks against the All Blacks. What's going to happen? They're yeah. going to they're going to get nailed every time. And now and now and they've disappeared. And and, and I wonder if you know yes they're probably because the the hey, magic now. The magic talk is something I've ne- on it. Honestly, I've never listened. I don't listen to radio very much anymore. I they miss used to be radio live though, right? They yeah, but it all live. but it all stopped, and then they relaunched this thing, magic, and then they had magic talk, which is the elements yes. of it. But it's not it's not the same beast. I think I think it, I mean I don't listen to it, so I'm not sure. But I think it still might have music in it as well. I don't listen to radio. Then I, I'm surprised at why there's so many numbers who do still. You know, I listened to radio sport before it got taken off. Because yep. that was a, a nice spot for it, and I listen to podcasts. You know, when I'm in my yep. car driving. But the other thing about moving to Dunedin, talk about what you what you miss and what you love. I you don't spend enough time in the car in Dunedin to do anything of right. value. Like I can't charge my phone in the car. Living in Auckland, yeah. I'd be an hour, hour and quarter drive home. My phone would be charged, or I'd listen to a whole podcast or something. In Dunedin, in rush yeah. hour. You know, it goes from a seven-minute drive to a twelve or thirteen-minute drive to get home, which sounds lovely, and it is lovely. But you realise what you can't do. You know, there's not very yeah. many there's not very many steak and cheese pies in Dunedin, and you can't char- <laughs> you can't charge your phone on your drive home. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I'm I'm the same. I don't listen to radio, and I th- and what's interesting now is any any radio show that you want to listen to, you can now get as a podcast anyway. Um, so it means that you don't have to listen to the music that you don't necessarily like and you don't have to listen to all of the ads that you would otherwise have to listen to. So, um, yeah, I'm finding that really interesting as well. So I do, that's that's what I do, and I'm exactly the same. I just listen to podcasts, you know. I don't, I mean, actually, I don't think our radio is even tuned in in the car. I think that um, one thing about listening to radio stations on a podcast, I don't think they should be in the... This is a little. I'm a bit bitter with this, so let's just bear with me. Because I don't they think they, be sh- in the chart. they shouldn't be in the podcast charts because they're not podcasts. Yeah. They're just repeat programs. Podcast charts yeah, should right. be podcasts only. It shouldn't be repeats yeah. of you know the Edge Drive Show. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Or they should, be, or they should be their own category. Yeah, I know. There's a bit bitterness there, but that's all right. I'll, I'll leave it. Yeah. At that. <laughs> hey, um, we got to talk about uh, TV and stuff and, and and movies and that as well. Obviously. Uh, would it be fair to say where most people were introduced to in a, in a larger scale would have been what we do in the shadows? Would that have been the first time you were in like a, a big, big production they got that kind yeah. of recognition? Because that was fucking huge and amazing. And the, the obviously yeah. the role you guys played was so amazing and that spun off into Wellington Paranormal as well. Tell us yeah. about tell us about what we do in the shadows first of all because one of my top 10 favourite films easily of all times. Um, right. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was great, man. I mean, it was really, it was really scary because I stum- I mean, I stumbled into acting really late. That was not something that I ever wanted to do or planned on doing. Um, so I was working in film as a runner um, for five years. I think you probably normally do running, which is an it's a go for essentially. You normally do it for one year and then you move into another department. But I never really liked the other department, so I didn't like being on set a lot because um, it was so boring. Mostly, it's standing around. Um, so with running, you got to drive around and you're always busy, which I like. But then right. somebody asked me if I wanted to um, audition for Tom Scott's um, film Separation City. Um, he had a role in that. So um, I didn't, but then I thought, oh, well, the only reason I wasn't doing it was because I was scared. So I went and auditioned <laughs> for that um, and got the role and, yeah, just absolutely loved it. So that was with Joel Edgerton and Les Hill and Daniel Cormack, um, Cohen Holloway. That was the first time I worked with him. Um, yeah, so that was awesome, and then that just sort of led into other other stuff. And the first, the audition for what we do in the shadows was um, was just improv, which I'd never done before. Right. Um, so it's just so that that scene where um, you know the cops arrive at the door and Tyka opens the door, and so that was the scene. So it's you're a cop, you knock on the door, I'm going to open the door, um, I'm not going to want to let you come in, but you're going to try and convince me that I'm that you're going to come in so that was it then and that and look that kiwi humor as well that deadpan I mean you do deadpan I want to say better than most if not better than anyone um but that deadpan kiwi delivery is just it's beautiful and especially when they do the you know the guys do the kind of uh, obi-wan you know these are not the droids you're looking for oh no that's all fine it's so funny it's so good I love it (laughs) yeah well it's I mean it's funny now isn't it I mean there'll be people that have grown up and they just think that that sense of humor has been around forever but I don't think it has I think I think it was born with flight of the concords and I do not think it exists I don't think I'd seen it with anything and then people finally went oh this first of all the Americans like it okay so that's okay we can like it 
Um, and then it became, it got latched onto. So then you had Taika doing it, um, you know, even, you know, with his short film, Two Cows, One Night, and then, which was obviously a lot more um, earnest than, um, you know, Eagle versus Shark and all these sorts of things. It was, it became the norm. But up until then, we we're constantly trying to do American humour better than the Americans or do English humour better than the English. And it just never stuck. And it was always so cringy. And those guys invented a humour or or found the humour, which was true to what New Zealanders are. Um, you know, being polite, um, you know, being in a situation where you're thinking one thing, um, but saying something else and that the audience is able to see that that contrast there. And but you, that's the that, norm and that allows you to have Baby Done and all these other films, which other, and Upbreaker Uppers specifically, um, yeah, which would not have existed without, without the but what it what it is as I mean that people think about that kind of deadpan as being quite simple and simplistic, because it's mm. it's kind of that less is more. And what I think sometimes yeah. when I'm watching American stuff, I'm like, that's a funny joke. Okay, now they're explaining the funny joke. Okay, yeah. now they're reiterating, and it's like it's it's like if it was a paragraph, it could be cut in half. But it's like they feel like they really need to deliver why the joke is the the joke, and then why it's yeah. funny. And then, you have to have the joke, and then you have to point at the joke, and yep. then you have to look at the camera and say, "Did you see the joke?" Yeah, 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 that yeah. And I actually think yeah. that that deadpan things that Kiwis do, and Taika is the, I guess the, you know, the Mozart of it at the moment, is that that less is more. It's actually smarter because you're actually going, yeah. "Here's the joke. I'm just going to give you the the bare bones of it. Now you figure that joke out and why it's funny." And it just it's beautiful. I love it so much. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing with a creative, isn't it? And if you're a, a comedian or or whatever you are, you're like, look what I did. I made a joke and look how funny it is. You know, to go, here's a joke and throw it away and to not even put or, or refer to it at all. It's so, That's such a brave thing to do because you risk nobody seeing the joke, you know, and then, then what's the point of having the joke? And But the beauty of, of things like Shadows and that was you, you would have all these jokes and that no one was pointing it. And then that's why a repeat watch is pay off so much because you're like yeah. shit i missed that, I missed no, that and I missed exactly that. exactly because that's the thing when things are underplayed that you can skip past them and pick them up on the second run yeah. through yeah um so here's here's the awkward question <laughs> which is better uh what we do in the shadows movie or tv series uh for me it's a tv series i agree i agree yeah. i think it's better and I mean, I love, like I just said, what we do in the shadows is a top ten movie of all times for me. I think the series yeah. is is better than the movie, which is saying something. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, the second season they really got into it. I haven't seen. Is the third one out? Yeah, it's not, is it? I don't think so. No, it's not. No, I mean, but for me, I love um, I love Matt Berry. Um, I love Natasha Dimitriou. Um I mean, yeah, I mean, it's. It's really, I mean, they're just so different, though, aren't they? One thing that I I think it misses a little bit, what misses for me is that um, in New Zealand, you sort of get the idea that, oh, we're in Wellington and it's really small. And I think the fact that it's set in, is it New Jersey or something? I think it's Manhattan, isn't it? And, well, I think it's somewhere even smaller. But So for me, it doesn't really register that that's a small place. It still, still seems like it's, right. well, it's New York. It's New York, massive. yeah. I think if it was in, like, Iowa or you know, Idaho, something like that would it would hit a bit. But that, yeah, no, it's very, very funny. But just so different, you know, and that's when you start talking about where you go budgets, uh, the the amount of budget that that's got compared to what the movie had and all those sorts of things. You've just got so much more time to work things out. And of course, the TV show just does not exist without the um, without what was created on the uh, in the film, you know. Oh. Uh, Obviously. So season three, I'm just looking on the Wikipedia page right now, Season three, uh, September second, twenty twenty one. Same, and there I think go. they've announced that they're doing a fourth season as well. Season three um, is only. I they got the first. I was going to say it's only four episodes, but it probably means they've only just released the details of the first four episodes. So right. September two, well, uh, twenty. Yeah, so in, in a month. Woohoo! That's exciting. How easy. It is one of those. Yeah, it is well, one of those ones you kind of. I when you see it pop up, you're like, oh, it's back! It's back! Let's watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. No, I um, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes because I don't think Jermaine was involved in this season. Um, so yeah, so who knows what effect that'll have? Probably substantial. Uh, running in the circles with a couple of Oscar winners now. You know, one of the from the Flight of the Concords and 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 Tyker as well. 
Is that a yeah? That, that, what does that feel like? Well, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because I mean, I met Brett briefly at a uh, at a wedding, um, which was at the start of last year, and Taika, I I sort of saw briefly on what we do in the shadows, and then we shot a um, a proof of concept for the TV show, and then ever since then he's been uh, he's off thawing it up. So I think to say that. I'm, <laughs> I think to say that I'm uh, operating in those circles is a bit of a stretch, but it's just incredible, you know, what those guys have done. And Jermaine, I mean, what Jermaine does and continues to do, it's just, it's amazing. And then with, with Wellington Paranormal, how that came out um, in the States, you know, we, we knew that it was going to be released over there, but then to see the coverage that it had, that it's getting reviews in, um, you know, Rolling Stone, the New York Times, um, you know, just every major publication that the, the, the US has got, just absolutely, you know, I found mind blowing. But that is a testament to how big a name Tiger is and how big a name Jermaine is, um, that they can get that kind of coverage over there is just is phenomenal. I don't think we really, well, I certainly didn't realise how big they were um, internationally. I was going to say, I haven't had, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about starting up what I'm going to call a hit list. Which is like the people I really want to have on the podcast, and obviously people like Tyka and Jermaine and you know yeah. Peter Jackson are these kinds of people I would love to have on. Yeah. Um. Um. But my pitch to Jermaine is going to be that he, he's actually the most important person in that trio. You know, they're all collaborations right. because people that work with him win Oscars. And my pitch is going to be, uh, like the last two golf tournaments I've played in, and it hasn't been for twenty years. But the last two golf tournaments I played, yeah. ha- I played in, people in my group of four got a hole in one. So obviously, right. obviously that's because of me, because I'm the connection between these two people getting holes in one. So I'm going to try and pitch to Jermaine that I'm the co- he's the connection for people winning Oscars. I can, I can tell you what, um, the only way that you would get Jermaine on a podcast is if you promise not to talk about him at all. Oh, really? <laughs> he is just not interested in talking about himself in the, in the slightest, or his achievements or anything like that. It's just, yeah, he is... Um, I think is probably his would be his least favorite thing in the world. Wow, has all that exposure? Well, I, would, I would say has that yeah, exposure yeah. for Wellington uh, Paranormal for you created opportunities or phone calls or whatever happens in Hollywood in America? I've had nothing. I've had absolutely nothing. There. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a desert, an absolute. Desert. I mean, what it, what it's done is it allowed me to do talkback which I'm really grateful for. And then all of that sort of stuff means that I then get asked to do the ACC cricket commentary stuff that I then am able to do um, Hodaki, which I otherwise it would never happen in a million years. But well, I can't tell you the last time I had an audition. Is that because no, of, of COVID though, mostly? No, 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 no. no there's, I mean, Karen's done like, four films and TV. I mean, she does so much, and which so she should, because I mean, the world's got enough forty-five-year-old guys with brown hair. Who think they're funny, <laughs> um, but they, they, there's very few Karens around. So I think I think um, the release of Paranormal in the States will hopefully do really huge things for her because she is just, I mean, she's amazing. And yeah, but I mean, I honestly, man, I get nothing. So I, which is fine by me because I sort of get, um, I get, I get bored quite easily. Um, so I love doing paranormal because that was like a five week shoot, but also nights. And then you do, you know, you write stuff and that's great for a while. And then producing stuff as well. And that's great for a while. So having a mix of things, but I don't know how people, I don't know how people do films that go for eight months. Like these, this Lord of the Rings TV show, like how you can do that for two years. I don't know how you could do Avatar for nine months. I don't know. Or Shortland Street, but I guess I never grew up with the dream of being an actor. You know, that was never the thing that got me out of bed. So doing a little bit of everything now and again is, is good for me. That would imply to me that you wouldn't be a fan of necessarily doing like a long um, stage run, whereas the same show every no, night. I, no, I mean, I've done one play. I did one play at Circa uh, a few years ago, and that was, you know, what was that? You know, that was a month. Um, but, yeah, how do you do Lion King, man? How do you do three years of eight shows a week? I mean, I sort of got a week into that play and I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's three weeks to go and then you wake up in the morning and it must be like doing stand-up and you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh Christ, I've got to do that tonight. So it sort of hangs over you because what it is is an opportunity to bugger up 
you know, to make a fool of yourself and that's sort of hanging over you all day. So, oh, yeah, I've got that. Then you finish it. Then you can't go to sleep because you're on a sort of a high and then you go to bed and then you wake up and it's and it's all over again. I mean, I really enjoy doing it, but I, I mean, yeah, I don't know how people would do those sorts of things for so long. It's interesting. Or Michael, Michael Crawford, who did Phantom of the Opera for 10 years. Or oh, Jesus. I wonder if we get to that stage, though, it's more of an ego thing. You know, you're the, you're the man on the world scene at that stage and everyone's coming. Like, I remember watching Lin-Manuel Miranda. I think he was talking on uh, Graham Norton and he said something like, yeah, you couldn't be sick because it was like Hollywood came to the show every night. And he tells a story right. about being sick one night and he missed Beyonce and Jay-Z coming to the show. Right. So, I, And I'm not saying that Lin-Manuel talks about you know being the arrogant god, but I wonder if there's an element of it that you're like, you know, I, I'm the star. They're coming to see me. This is my... You know, my, my chance. Yeah, my well, I'll tell you what, I never saw Beyonce in the crowd. At circuit, <laughs> <laughs> Not even once. But yeah, there would be a part of that, and especially when people work so long to get any kind of success. You know, you work and you work and you work and nothing happens. And finally something happens. It's like, oh, I've, you know, I've got to keep on going. And, and you sort of look at Tyker and how much work he does. It's like you think, God, man, you must, you, you can do with a break, surely. But he just works and works and works. And I guess it's that thing where, you know, you you just want to make the most of the opportunities that you've got. But, you know, I sort of look at it like, you know, when you're younger and you and you go out on the booze every weekend or twice a weekend or three, because you don't want to miss out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to miss out. You, miss, you know, what if I miss out? And then it gets to a point where you don't go out and you realise that you don't miss out on anything. It's more. It's just more of the same, you know. So once you get to a point where you're like, oh, actually, I don't, I don't really care. Um I think that's the way to go. Not to have too much investment in what you're doing one way or the other. Um, so you're never going to be um, sort of crushed by the lows or, you know, overjoyed by the highs. You've just got to try and maintain a sort of a level a level attitude to everything, which I didn't always have. You know, I got I did a, uh, I got cast in a, um, in a show, a really big show, and it was my first lead in something. And... Um, Five days before we started shooting, I got fired. Wow. <laughs> yeah, which was a crushing experience. Um, and then uh, because of, at the table read, um, they didn't like the way I read at the table. Uh, they liked the audition. But then, so that then, which was, you know, at the time really difficult, but then served to be the biggest motivating the, that gave me the kick in the ass that I needed to then stop talking about writing and actually start writing because I'd always done a little bit here and there but never been driven enough to actually get off my ass and do it. But that was the thing that made me uh, write the Water Cooler web series. Yeah. Um, so within five months, I'd written that and had that funded and then that led into the next season, which then led into you know everything else really. So, yeah, so the, I think the failures are great, but what it meant was, you know, if you get something that's really great come along like Wellington Paranormal don't get too excited about it um, and if something bad happens don't worry about it too much because something else is around the corner if you're working hard enough um, you know they all even out hopefully so is it worse to be cut pre-production or is it worse to film everything and then be left on the cutting room floor uh, I haven't had the experience the second experience but the, the I think probably being cut I mean being cut I'd rather be cut based on how I read at a table than getting four days into the shoot and then going, now your acting's the problem. <laughs> you know, it'll be horrible to be on set and then get fired like um, Eric Stoltz and Back to the Future who did like three weeks, I think, before they recast. I mean, that'd be, that'd be tough. And then everybody refers to that. Like he's the person that you refer to. I've been stoltzied. I've been stoltzied. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's a pretty vulnerable place to be in. And, um, yeah, I mean, I guess how you um, react to that is going to be, you know, be very easy to crawl under a rock, but you don't want to prove people right. You want I, to prove them wrong. I had friends who had a, a son in a, uh, a role in, I think it was Pete's Dragon. Oh, yeah. And the other thing about being left on the cutting room floor, which is sad, is that, you know, lots of talk about it and lots of excitement and all this, and everyone knows, and you go to the cinema, and then it's not there at all. Exactly. Like, because it's be, so it's that uh, the playing it down, eh? It's like, we'll wait till it comes out and make sure if we've got a smaller role, not that that's what we're talking about with you, that it actually makes totally. the final edit as well. 
Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. So I, you know, I got to the point where I didn't tell anyone because, of course, you tell everybody you got this big role, and then you have to tell those same people that you've been fired. So it is. <laughs> She's rough, man. She's rough. Um, I, yeah. You you started off in the kind of um, not acting side of the business, showrunners that kind yeah. of stuff. As you said, you went into the you know became known as the act uh, acting side of it with some of the things we've talked about. But you've gone back into the producing side of it, and uh, you're producing the movie uh, Coming Home in the Dark. Uh, what I'll do yeah. is I'll, I'll I'll put a little bit of this on in the background. We won't be able to hear it, but um, then when I talk to you about it, you can. Uh, talk to it this is good professional stuff isn't it here we go uh so you're uh, so you're producing it it's coming home in the dark the trailer's playing beside you whilst you're talking about it uh thriller yeah. horror in the in the cinemas now how does one yes. move firstly from the acting to producing because i always think about producers as sort of the money bags i know it's not yeah. accurate but i th that's how i think about it and then yeah. and then tell us about um coming home in the dark yeah well for me it's well, i think everything that i've ever ended up doing i've only ever done it because I didn't want to waste anybody else's time and it's I just find it's easier to do things yourself than to try and find somebody um, and then to be expecting them to do the things to the level that you do them or as be psychotic as I am about things because I get obsessive and I work really hard on things because if you're not going to do that then what's really the point um, and so for me it was you know when that water cooler thing came up I just ended up being the producer on it because that's just how it was and I ended up writing it because that was how it was and I ended up acting in it because that was how it was. So, um, yeah, I, so I, when I first moved into film when I was 26, I wanted to make sure that I was making something, at least one thing a year, because it seemed that when I was on the films that I was working on, I started on pickups for Return of the King, then the King Kong, um, District 9, Avatar, sort of had people that were working that initially when they started working in film they wanted to be creative and they wanted to make things but they didn't you know they sort of got into this routine of this just being their job and they could have been working at telecom or wherever else it was just a job for them right. so i knew that i had to be making sure i was making something every year at least one thing a year to try and keep that going so i made about eight short films and it was just me and a mate matt tuffin who would do the camera and the sound we had another mate that would cut things and I just make write these stupid things and just to see how they went and I didn't want to waste a professional crew's time. Um, so by the time it got to the water cooler and I got funding from New Zealand on air for that, I'd done enough where I was prepared to ask the friends that I'd made in the business um, to come and work for a pitiful amount of money. <laughs> um, so yeah, I produced water cooler, did the first two seasons of that. The second season of water cooler came 20th in the uh, web series world cup out of about just under a thousand entries wow, cool. uh, yeah so that was really great and then after that i think after that i was introduced to james ashcroft um who was the director um the director of coming home in the dark and he had done a bunch of things we had a common friend but he was having real trouble finding a producer that just wanted to that could get things done but wasn't um sort of worried about doing things the way that they had always been done you know he, he'd done eight short films but he'd done them with toy Fikari, um with the students there at the end of year he hadn't gone through that that film commission system right and the system sort of you've got to do short films you've got to do the fresh shorts you've got to do this and then you eventually work your way up but he didn't really want to do that he wanted to make features and I was looking for people that were as motivated as me to make things. Um, so he had a, um, a script called for Jenny Penn, The Rule of Jenny Penn, which was written by Owen Marshall, who also wrote Coming Home in the Dark, which he'd optioned. And that script was just unbelievable. So I gave him notes on that script. Um, and based on that, he asked me to be the producer. And I think ignorance is bliss, man. You're just like, well, this is, I love this script and I really want to see this film made. So you've just, you've got this passion for it. Now, what do I have to do to get this film made? And what do I have to do to allow James to make the film that he sees? And so when you're ignorant, you don't know, you know, what you're up against. You just go, oh, well, I'll do it. And then looking back, you go, Jesus, I can't believe I <laughs> Yeah. Right? And so but there was Catherine Fitzgerald, who's an experienced um, producer. She was on as, as an executive producer. 
Um, and we went over to Melbourne uh, Film Festival where they have a market where you, you've got um, sales agents and distributors from all around the world and you go to market and you pitch them your ideas. And I'd been working in film for 10 or 12 years and I had no idea that that even happened to so in your own world. And they just said, look, you're never going to get this made. Um, you know, the script's great, but it's sort of, in the, you know, Jenny Penn is sort of stars old people, which is great, but the genre is horror. But old people want to see old people, but they don't want to see horror. And young people want to see horror, but they don't want to see old people. So it was just this thing where they were just like, well, we can't, we can't sell it. So I found that really interesting. So then James and I decided that we could, we, there's no doubt we're going to get a great, we'll get great cast for that script, but they're never going to come and work for you that's never directed anything or me that's never produced anything. So let's make something else first and use that as a calling card. And so uh, he and Eli went off and wrote Coming Home in the Dark. Um, and then we got that funded pretty quick. We knew that the way to pitch it was we had to put the be the strongest team together. So if I'm an experienced, he's an experienced, we surround ourselves with really experienced people. So we've got Desiree Armstrong on board as another producer, Annie Collins, who's just an incredible um, editor. She's just amazing, done some of the best films in New Zealand. And then just in every position, like first AD and production designer, costume designer, when you submit to um, the film commission, just making sure that we were surrounded by experience mm. um, and the places where they initially would have seen us as the weakest, we made that as our strongest point. Um, and that's what happened. We got funded straight away really quickly and shot really quickly and, and delivered the film really quickly. And the only thing that's really slowed it down is, is COVID. Um, but the film is probably the thing I'm most proud of out of anything that we've done. I put it up there as, one of the best New Zealand films ever made. I just think it's amazing. Well, I haven't, I haven't, James, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen the film yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it because when I watched the uh, uh, the preview to it as well, I thought of a couple of things. I thought, it, I mean, I'm not comparing them, but I've just recently fallen in love with A Quiet Place and seen A Quiet Place 2 at the cinema sort of thing. And obviously thematically yeah. it's nothing like it, but it, it, it looked like it kind of, there might be a similar feel. I don't know if that's fair or not because I haven't seen it. But I just made me think, oh, this this feels like it's in the same, let's put it this way, it's in the same part of the stadium as our film, and yeah, I totally. quite attracted me to it. Yeah, it's that, it's that thing of just having, of just being tense the entire time, you know, and I think you've got to be careful, you know, a lot of the reviews have been incredible, you know, we're getting four and a half stars and five stars, and it, it had its world premiere at Sundance, which is, I think, one of only eight films New Zealand's ever had to do that, so... So a pretty fine company, but you're just constantly in a state of tension. Uh, but in a good way, you know, it's not horrific. Like for me, one of the worst films, one of the best films I've ever seen was Black Swan. Right. But I'll never watch that film again, man, because it was just, <laughs> it was just, but that doesn't mean that I didn't thoroughly enjoy the experience, but it was just so, so hard. And this film is, it's, James has done such a masterful job, as has any the sound design, all of that, it is a really tense experience. Uh, but thematically, it's really, um, it's got some really important themes that it operates on, which are happening in New Zealand at the moment. I just think everybody that goes to see, we've been doing Q&As around the country and every, like nobody leaves the cinema, you know, and people are just pinned to their seats. You know, we had, we did a uh, press screening where we had a rammed cinema and the credits rolled and nobody moved. Nobody made a sound. You know, normally at those sorts of things, people, either, you know, they clap politely or or genuinely. Um, but in this, it just, you know, seasoned film reviewers didn't, did not move. Wow. Just sat there and hear a pin drop all the way through the end of the credits. And then the lights cut. It's just, it's a hell of an experience. I think one of the, one of the good reviews that came out of Sundance was it's not so much a film that you see as a film that happens to you. And so when you leave you're mulling it over for days. You know, it's not all tied up and you walk away. It's something that you're constantly thinking about, which is- I, I like uh, that. I mean, it's, it's a really, I'm gonna give you a really silly kind of a, a parallel here, but because it's a long time ago, but for years and years and years and years and years and decades, we are watching Hollywood movies that have a nicely wrapped up bow at the end of it. And it wasn't yeah. until, this is the silly movie, but Mrs. Doubtfire came along, that the, right. hu the husband and wife didn't get back together at the end. Yeah, exactly. But they found a conclusion. I was like, oh, that's it. That's different. Yeah, it's a, it. yeah. 
Yeah, 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 exactly. So it, it was a it was a happy ending, but it wasn't the happy yeah. ending. And I like oh, that's right. I like you talking about Black Swan and having that movie that you don't want to watch twice. I feel a bit the same about Joker. I right. um I came I came out of the Joker when that was a masterpiece. What a fucking horrific movie. That was amazing. <laughs> I want everyone to see it. I don't think I'll yeah. ever watch it again because yeah, at, yeah. at the end of that I was like all you know all bent up inside and was like there's something about this which was a genius piece of well I still say Shelley Lloyd even though it's digital but you know but I but but it was horrible what a horrible movie and it was amazing yeah totally and that's the thing and it's nice to it's nice for people to have that experience with films because they don't you know it is it is 99 percent you know just that safe sort of stuff which is fine but when you can have an experience which is outside of that it becomes, I think, art rather than just a movie, you know, rather than just something to waste your time on or spend some, not waste your time on, but, um, you know, kill a couple of hours sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with those films. Man, I watch tons of stuff and I watch every piece of trash that comes out. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I think it, if you can have something that is a different experience than that, um, I think, yeah, you just got to get out there and, and watch them you know because they are rare they don't come along very often it sounds like a little bit as well and i i kind of relate to this for my own um i don't know, call it career call it whatever job that i do is you're a bit of a build it and they will come you make stuff yeah. that you want to make and you look for it to find an yeah. audience and right. and it's it's i know it's different when you're in a uh, a radio studio and there's there's like there are people above you but still within that studio from experience you have the control to shape the show as you want and i know what i'm doing at the moment with various podcasts and there's three other initiatives i'm trying to get off the ground that will still be in the studio it's that idea of going uh it's you talked about holding things lightly and i might be paraphrasing what you said but it's that you know if you have three or four things on the go i love that kind of life because you're then insecure in the fact that if any one falls away you're not left yeah. there like someone who's lost their job at the petrol station who's now got nothing. But also yeah. it, it means that, you know, you might have your creative bent into the producing side at the moment, so you drive hard there. You know, next month you might, you might be really creative in the radio aspect, so you drive hard on that studio. And it's and it keeps life interesting as well. Yeah, totally. And, and, and certainly what you're saying there about, you know, making things, you know, build it and they will come. And you've just got to be totally true to what it is that interests you, right? That's what we're saying about the comedy before, the New Zealand comedy. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to make something, you're like, oh, I bet an audience will like this. Let's make this. Then it will fail. It will 100% fail because there's no truth in that voice. And, you know, and you don't have to attract 100% of the people. You just need to attract enough of the people that have a similar, you know, sort of outlook on life as you. And there's always plenty enough audience to go around, you know. And it's just a matter of sticking it out. You know, there's a guy on, um, have you heard Lex G's podcast? Uh, no, I have not. He's an American guy and he's really super neurotic, film nerdy sort of guy. And he's so funny. Um, you know, he bags himself for being a pathetic loser and all this sort of stuff. But and talks about, you know, goes off on riffs about uh, Mark Wahlberg or whatever. And they're hilarious podcasts. But he sort of gave it about three months and then he quit. And then sort of he's, he's on Twitter bemoaning the fact that it wasn't a huge success and other people are successes and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I think you just need to do it because you enjoy it and you love doing it. And then if people come along and they, they get into it, then great. And that's my sort of policy with the radio show. Jason and I, um, we just do things that we think are funny. We're not trying to go, oh, how can we grow an audience? And with Talkback, we're saying, you know, uh, if Jason and I are making each other laugh, then we know other people are going to find it funny. But if you're trying to go, what will an audience find funny? Then you fail before you begin because yeah. you're not going to enjoy the process and the audience isn't going to relate to it either. Yeah. And I mean, there are people who really, really, really find that lane and say that you look at the Adam Sandlers of this world, he plays himself almost other than that one precious gems the gems movie that came out which he was very different and yeah. amazing but most of his movies he plays a version of himself and but the thing is he's unbelievably successful because there is a huge portion of the audience that wants to see him playing a version of himself <laughs> so he's found his lane yeah that's right yeah i mean um yeah he's he's a really good example but i just he's one of those guys where i'm like ah oh, man i wish you'd just do funny stuff again i mean what i don't like about those comedies is that they get to a point and that with 40 minutes to go they start teaching you a life lesson 
I guess really sad thing. That's why I don't watch an Adam Sandler. I mean, if I'm watching Adam Sandler movies for a life lesson, then I've got real problems. All I want is for you to make me laugh for 90 minutes. I don't need to learn lessons about family and valuing blah, blah. But, you know, he makes billions of dollars, so who the hell am I? But then you look at the original stuff, you know, the Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. There was none of that in there, and they were authentic no. uh, hilarity. The I love those. And then <laughs> and he actually had one come out a couple of years ago called, years ago called That's My Boy. Right. Have seen that? I haven't seen it, but it's on Netflix, I think, at the moment. It is. It's got him and uh, Adam Sandberg in it, and it fucking bombed. And that is the funniest fucking movie he's made for 25 years, man. It was, it is incredible. He's a real piece of shit. And it's just, it's brilliant. But because now he's got this persona that he's developed where he's the family guy, then that was just... Outside his lane. To, to, Outside his yeah, lane. So well, That's why the audience is lane. Yeah, it yeah. was brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the audience did not go along to it because it wasn't, you know... Drew Barrymore and you know whoever else he gets into his movies. So he Real didn't show. he didn't um, attract a new audience because the new audience always like I oh, know we don't like his stuff, and his current That's audience right. was like this is not what we're looking paying for, therefore no one saw it. Exactly, yeah. I mean it's Adam Sandler as a as a guy that just gets on the piss all the time and hooks up with heaps of chicks, even though he's you know fifty five. Um, it's very funny. Watch it if you haven't seen it. Man. He'd, he'd be on my list. He'd be on my list of podcasts. He'd be uh, he'd be a yeah. I'm gonna try and try and get him. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, it's been a, it's been real fun talking to you, Mike. I'm just gonna tell people again. Uh, let's bring up the old uh, computer screen again here and say if people want to hear you Monday to Friday four to seven on Hodaki uh, nationwide. Yeah. They, I, now I'm assuming that you guys you guys do well. Someone in the building does a podcast of your show as well. I'm assuming that's yeah, it, mate. Man. They pump that one out as well, yeah. And of course, in, in cinemas right now, coming home in the dark. I was going to say about that title. The thing about the title that's so genius, it's a bit like um, Snakes on a Plane. Like, that's the stupidest title for a movie in the world. <clears throat> but yeah. immediately, it gives you what it is. It, it tells yes. you what the movie is. And you kind of go, I'd be terrified if I saw a snake on a plane. So it's, it's, it's a yeah. terrible uh, title. <laughs> but it's also the perfect title. It's a bit, I'm not saying yours, yeah. is, yours is not a terrible title. I've got a, a border who lives with me and... She um came upstairs at ten thirty last night, and she was just like, "I just walked home from university." I'm like, what the fuck are you walking home from university at ten thirty? She's like, "Oh, it's fine." And it's just that coming home in the dark concept, you know that that there is there is always some amount of unknown, and unknown leads to fear yeah. when you can't see yeah. what's ahead of you, what's in the dark. And so I yeah, think totally. it's it's I'm very much looking forward to seeing it, and um yeah, because it, it already evokes sort of fear. The fear of the unknown, no, the fear of what's I mean, over there I'd in the love, dark. I'd love, to, I'd love to have a chat with you after you've seen it because it is, it is some, it's a film that you have to talk about with somebody else who's seen it. <laughs> okay. One of those, so, so make sure you go along with someone. Like I made a mistake of going, oh, well, not a mistake, but I went and saw Shopping, that Louis, uh, Louis Sutherland film from um, a few years ago. And I just went home and I sat there and drank a bit, you know, it's probably eight years ago or something. I sat there and drank a bottle of red wine and, smoked about 20 cigarettes just thinking about it you know it's but to be able to talk out the themes because at the end of it you really are like well what would it be what do you do you know um and i think yeah so and also i'll probably i'll hook you up with james ashcroft the director as well if you want yeah. to have a, a with him and he's got some really fascinating stuff coming up as well he's um he's signed with caa in in the states um, and is now doing Max Brooks's Devolution. So Max Brooks, obviously, who wrote World War Z. Yeah. Um, James is um, doing doing his Sasquatch um, horror film um, for Legendary Pictures, who did Batman and Inception and all that sort of stuff. So he's a really good, interesting guy, man. He's he's taken a really slow journey to getting to the point where he's acted, directed a film. Like he's forty or forty two now, and he was in no rush, and now it's just you know it's taken off from so he's he's a great chat as well it's fascinating seeing people who kind of hit success a bit later i mean you can look at and i know i did this because when i was 40 i wasn't quite doing what i wanted to do you look at the people who have hit success after 40 and you see names like ricky gervais and you see names like um gosh, oh there's so many and the names just jumped out of my head but from shawshank redemption plays god and everything uh, uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. All these people who was like, yeah. once they hit forty, that's when their careers go. Pshh. And I think they. Totally right, I think you come with something different. You come with life experience. And that's not to speak down anybody who you know hits it massive or gets successful at twenty one. But 
you know, there's something else you bring to a party when you hit it at 40 than at 20. Oh, absolutely right. And that was always a thing for me. It was always Ricky Gervais. I was like, well, he was 40 or 41, so I'm okay. I'm still okay, you know. It's like, you know, it's it's okay if things take you a little bit longer because I took 10 years off to get drunk, you know. So um, you, everything was always going to come a little bit later if it was going to happen at all. But, um, yeah, and I guess that when you're older as well, you're definitely uh, more obliged to listen to the voices in your own head rather than what other people are telling you, you know. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, what a great dog. Oh, this is my little girl. Our old 12, 18 months? Uh, what are you, mate? You're eight and a half. This is Nala. Wow, oh, really? God, yeah. what a great dog. Yeah. She's, uh, are you off? You can go. What do you want to do? Go. What a beautiful, right. beautiful coat there, mate. What kind of shampoo are you using? <laughs> uh, don't, don't know. Uh, go down to the uh, pet store um and use the they've got those dog washers which are like car washers <laughs> yeah 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 oh that's awesome now yeah, she's she's my rock, she's my wee mate um yeah i'll show you yeah we've got, one, we've got one as well which is um yeah they're bloody good and yeah. funny now having a kid the kid's two years old um so she's um yeah starting to put the dog into headlocks which is um amusing for everyone uh, but the dog i'll show you she's in the what i call the green room at the moment just chilling out, waiting. Now I go into camera two. Hang on. There we go. There she is. <laughs> You're getting stared at. Is it time for a walk? I don't know. I took a um, drop the kids off to the uh, to school this morning. How old are your kids? Uh, got three. Uh, seventeen who lives with her mum. Uh, yeah. fifteen who basically lives with me, and a twelve yeah. year old who goes between. Oh, beautiful. So we've got a, a nice park. I don't take her to the dog park anymore. She's a bit of a nervous little dog. And she was showing right. signs of being nervous when she was younger. Lots of tail between the legs. But I've trained her really well with the ball. Like, here, okay, so here's something for dog owners, right? Here's, here's the, my one lesson for you that I will say. For the first kind of three months of your dog's life, four or five months if you want, six months is fine, every time you call them, give them a treat. Like, like literally every every single time if you do that yeah. you will never have a problem calling them and having them come so i can take her up the right. hill i take her up the hill and, and like i'd throw the ball for her and every time she bought the ball back i'd give her a treat and so we go yeah. up the hill to a more of a public park it's not the dog park and we just burn around there for 10 15 minutes so on the way home from the school drop off today i stopped there just for 10 minutes you know 40 throws with the ball come down here and we'll go yeah. we'll go back up there after lunch and we'll do a good half hour but just giving her some energy, burn some energy off so she can come hang with me in the studio. And oh, it's bloody good, eh? They're good ones. I got her for me. I, I decided that, you know, my kids are of the age that, you know, let's say a dog lives to 15. They'll probably all be out of home. So I decided yeah. that although my kids love her and want to own her, she's my dog, and I got her because, <laughs> be, because, yeah. because I'm the one who's taking responsibility for her. And, you know, like the 15, the 17-year-old's basically already gone. The 15-year-old could be gone in three or four years. And yeah. so I need to have a dog that I'm going to want to keep. So that's why I got a little, little. Oh, I think so, mate. That's going to be a difficult empty, empty nest, that one. Well, I live in a six yeah. bedroom house at the moment. And the hardest thing is actually the size of it. But I built my studio downstairs. And um, it's going, what's going to be most strange when I lose the kids, like when they got to university and stuff, is actually what, uh, what do I do? I probably will either sell or move out and just get something little. I'm quite looking forward to that, yeah. actually. But. It's good at the moment. Oh, totally. It's, um, the less vacuuming, the better. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Mike Minogue from Hodaki, and also coming home in the dark. People should get there to see that. It's been uh, yes, a, a lot of fun having a chat with you today. I really yeah, enjoyed it. Check, man. And, um, yeah, give us a shout when you've had a had a geese. Yeah, and what I'll do is, do, do you already know what the what the path is for the movie? Is it going to DVD next? Is it going to Netflix? Is there a is there a path uh, for it? We, we have sold it. I'm not sure if it's been announced, so I can't say, but it's, okay. it's got distribution uh, in every territory around the world, I think, now, so it's done really well there. It's coming out in Australia in theatres on the 7th of September, in the States on the 1st of October, um, and then I'm not sure what, yeah, because what you were saying, like, oh, yeah, what about the dvd run and the I was like, yeah. do they still do that yeah i know i don't know so we'll, we'll find i don't know if they, they just skip that and you end up on a streaming service yeah or, or you can be you can be on it you can, yeah you can still be on apple itunes where they can pay to download it yeah i had yeah. a i had a thing the other day where i got a new phone because one of my kids needed a phone so i gave them mine and because i have to get a new one but with a new phone came apple tv for a year 
So yeah. I've signed on to Apple TV for a year, and it's pretty. I got that as well. I got that as well with um, I got a new laptop, and yeah. um, you're amazed by how little there is to watch on Apple <laughs> TV. What there Apple TV? Fun. What Apple TV seems to be is a good place to go and watch one or two things. Like I'm very much looking forward to the uh, Jennifer Aniston Reese Witherspoon series two of that series of the news roomy type series. I yeah, did en- so, yeah. I did enjoy the first series of that. But it seems yeah. to really just be a funnel to send you through to iTunes to then pay for something. That's what it seems to be. hundred <laughs> percent. And even then, there's nothing. There's nothing to buy on there. I mean, I've been trying to watch Wrath of Man for about three months, but it still costs you thirty dollars to rent it. It's like I'm not paying thirty dollars to rent a Guy Ritchie movie. I'm just not. I just um, my girlfriend had never seen Breaking Bad. And so just right, yeah. two days ago, we finished again the whole series of Breaking Bad. And I was amazed the amount of stuff that I had no memory of. I remembered some of the big yeah. key points. Like I remembered the yeah. finish and I remembered, you know, some things that went on. But even on the final episode, there were some things that I, I didn't remember. As one of those programs, again, it gets darker and darker as it goes on. Speaking of, yeah. you know, coming home in the dark, you don't go away from that feeling good, but you go away from that feeling entertained and, and impressed You're with the quality. Insane. That's right. My wife had never seen The Sopranos, so we watched all of that through. And we're up to the final season of The Wire at the moment. Um, and, yeah, I think Breaking Bad's probably next because she hasn't seen that either. So I remember I remember loving Breaking Bad, but there was, there was a lot more points in that where I was like, ah, oh, really? Was that? Was that? I tell you, I I tell you of- re-watching Breaking Bad, I was surprised at the little amount of meth cooking that was done. Like, oh really? Because in my Sorry. head, in my head, it's like, yeah. oh, they're always cooking and selling meth, and actually, yeah. there's a lot of it, which is like, like the majority of it, which is not. But because that's the main theme that runs through, I guess your brain kind of goes, yeah. that's what the program's about, and it's and actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. it's not. But we but we're the same. Like, um, I've never seen Sopranos, and neither has my girlfriend. So we're going to watch that, and we've just started watching Westworld. Because I've oh, seen yeah. I've seen the first three or four episodes, but I haven't seen any more. Yeah. So we, we're first doing season of West, first season of Westworld is great. Yeah, from memory, and then the second season, I just pulled out. Right, I just got really stupid. And but Sopranos, man, for me is the best. There's if all of these shows have got seasons which aren't great. You know, there's they sort of vary. Yep. But the Sopranos, like from episode one, that pilot. Is just every single character you just know exactly who they are from the moment they. It's just, it's you have got a treat in store. Good. with that man, it's so good. Gandolfini, right. but every looks fucking great. Now you obviously have to get off to work, so we should let you go and just say, Mike Minogue, thanks again for coming on board. I'm coming home in the dark, and obviously we can hear you this afternoon on Hodaki. Should we tune in? And it's been a pleasure. And what we'll do is whatever the next stage of Coming Home in the Dark is, whether it's Apple TV or whether it's Apple iTunes or whether it's DVD, let's book in a time to catch up again before That's like awesome. before that gets released so we can give it a push. But also then yeah, we'll we'll be, give it a chance to react to, to the movie as well. Awesome, mate. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, brother. Cheers, Mike. Cheers, man.